as we continue our series in the book of Jeremiah. And I personally have been just amazed by this series here in Jeremiah. When Steve and I were talking about what would come next in our series, uh, just in my normal everyday Bible reading, I was getting close to Jeremiah, and I realized that I would be in Jeremiah when we started and continue to read in Jeremiah, and just such a powerful book. Um, I want to start with this idea, and I think that this idea is a very prevalent idea. I think that it's out there, and I think it's a very surface-level read, and that is the idea that in the Old Testament, God was kind of a mad mean, vindictive, or at least malicious God. He was kind of irritated all the time. He, were, he really wasn't too happy. But then when you get to the New Testament, suddenly he becomes a happy God. He loves everybody. He sends his son and stuff like that. And I think especially here in this part of Jeremiah that we're going to be looking at this morning, I think you're going to see that the merciful, loving, caring, right there God has always been there. It's right there. He's there in the Old Testament with love and mercy and, most importantly, grace. And we're going to see that. So this morning, if you looked at our uh, uh, bulletin last week and saw which passages we'd be in today, you'd see we're in Jeremiah 7, 8, and 9, which should make you go, oh no, we're going to be here until dinner time going through all these verses, right? So, no, we're not. We, we are going to be a little selective here in what we bring out of this text. But this section is what we sometimes call the temple sermon. It's very similar to another, uh, pass, n- another sermon here in the book of Jeremiah. And it could be that it's a retelling of the same sermon, or perhaps he gave that sermon more than once. Some of us have needed to hear something more than once for it to sink in. Am I right? So here we are. So now I want us to join Jeremiah, though, in this this passage. And I want us to be with him and standing there. And where is he at? He's at the temple, the Solomonic temple. And I imagine he's standing in front of it. So we're going to be there with him in the court. And we're going to listen to his words, okay? And we're going to start with this. Uh, primarily, uh, we'll pick it up here in chapter 7, verse 3. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Verse 4, do not trust in deceptive words, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, There were no punctuation marks, and so they had no exclamation point. And if they had had an exclamation point, he probably could have said the temple of the Lord once there and just followed it by an exclamation point. But in Hebrew, since there's no such thing as an exclamation point, he had to say it a few times. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord which should indicate to us that, again, imagining that Jeremiah is standing before you in front of the Solomonic Temple, I imagine that he, he, he points to the temple and says, don't trust the prophets who are telling you that the Babylonians are not going to come into the city, they're not going to take it because we have the temple. The temple is right here. And the temple, it seems, has become at least a little bit of kind of a good luck charm, kind of an amulet or a a thing to have. It has some sort of mystical, magical powers. And those mystical, magical powers are going to keep the Babylonians out of this. But Jeremiah is warning the people, don't think like that. Don't treat the temple of the Lord as though it's just some mystical, magical amulet or something like that. We have to go beyond that. Look at what he says here, starting in verse 5. He, he's already said in verse 3 to amend your ways. Here he's going to give us what ways are we to amend. Verse 5. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor... Verse 6, if 
you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin. God has started this message telling Jeremiah, you're going to tell this to the people, and you're going to tell them, amend your ways. And here are the ways that he needs us to amend. And what I really want you to see is, this really isn't people. Let's get more religious. Let's get more religious. God needs more sacrifices. God needs more devotion at the temple, and we need to be more outwardly religious. Look at what he talks about. He talks about if you amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice, a man to his neighbor. This is common everyday life. This, this really isn't even what we normally think of as some sort of religious activity. He's saying when you interact with people, interact with justice. When you're interacting with your neighbor, do so with the mindset of here is somebody created in the image of God, and for that reason itself, I should treat this person the same way I would want to be treated, right? He goes on to say, do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow. If he has to tell us do not do this, what can we assume? That this has been going on, right? And he goes on to say, do not shed innocent blood in this place. Which seems to suggest, once again, innocent blood has been shed in this place. And finally, do not walk after other gods to their own ruins. I want to ask you a question. When we sin, are we really hurting God in some sort of uh, hurtful sense? Or are we really hurting ourselves by choosing to sin? We really are choosing ourselves to, to, I've heard this illustration, I love this illustration. When you think about God's commands and how, how mean and, and just restricting my fun God's commands are, have you ever noticed that as you're driving on the road, there's these lines on either side of you? And those lines say, keep your vehicle right here between this line and this line. Do you know why that's there? Because that's the safest place for you to drive. If you get too far into this lane, or crossing this line, you could go off the road, right? And if you go too far across this line, you could run into an oncoming car, right? So those lines aren't there to restrict your fun. Those lines are not there to say, we're just going to control how you drive. Those lines are there to keep you and I safe and to help us when we interact with other people going in the other direction, right? Makes sense. And a lot of God's commands are just that. So oftentimes when we choose to sin against God, I imagine us sitting on a branch and us sawing that branch, but we're sawing on the side that connects to the tree, right? And that's always intelligent. Verse 7 <clears throat> If you do all these things, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever. So if you do these things, I'm going to keep you in this land. Because God had a purpose, right? When God called Abraham, when he took him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, when he said this land is going to be yours and your descendants forever, he has a purpose, right? But the northern kingdom of Israel wasn't keeping his purpose. The southern kingdom of Judah hasn't been keeping his purpose. And God is saying, we need to reset this, right? Now, here's one of those times I'm going to jump ahead in the text. But I just want to point out verses 12 through 15. We're not going to get into them. But this is where God, God tells the people, consider what I did at Shiloh. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was. The people have left Egypt, they wander in the wilderness, they come into the land, and they set up the tabernacle at Shiloh. And the people do good and are always religious and always keep God's ways, right? Wrong. They take the ark of the Lord into battle, and what happens? The ark gets captured. You remember that story, right? 
Now, what exactly happened to Shiloh? We a little bit have to speculate because we don't have a specific verse that tells us. But it's believed that the Philistines had destroyed Shiloh, despite the fact that the tabernacle had been there. And the people seem to be thinking that because we have the temple, we're going to be okay. And yet God is saying, hey, 400 years ago, I dwelt in the tabernacle at Shiloh, and because you didn't keep my ways, look at Shiloh, take that as an uh, illustration. Verse 16 is a very fascinating verse here in the text. And I want to point out a few things to you. God is speaking to Jeremiah in this passage. And I think we have to realize that, and I think we have to keep that in mind sometimes. Who's the speaker, and who is the first audience? So picking it up in verse 16, As for you, so God is speaking, and the you here is Jeremiah, as for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up cry or, pray, or, or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. This is a tragic passage. This is a sad passage. God is literally telling the prophet, don't pray for these people, because I've set my mind, I know what I'm going to do, I want to emphasize this. God is speaking to the prophet. God is not speaking to you this morning. We can't go to this passage and go, oh, look, here's a passage where God said, don't pray for people. So that means I'm free to not pray for my neighbor. I'm, pray f I'm free to not pray for my community. I'm free to not pray for my state. I'm, pr I'm free to not pray for my nation because here we see God telling one guy to not pray. Again, God has a specific purpose here at this time, and he's saying something very specific to this prophet. Why is this? If we continue, and I encourage you to go ahead and read this, it's great stuff, because God is literally going to describe why. It's not arbitrary. God didn't wake up this morning and go, you know what, I'm just done with these people. You know, If you look at this, you're going to see everything about why this is going on. I want to highlight verse 27. Verse 27, God is saying to the prophet, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. This is the reason that Jeremiah is given the permission to not pray for these people. Because God has set his mind, he knows what's gone on, and he has a purpose. Once again, we don't get to claim that. God has not given us special revelation to tell us what's going to happen next. So we need to, and I have to emphasize that, we need to continue to pray for our neighbor, continue to pray for our community, our city, our state, our country, right? A few more head nods and we can move on. Thank you. Now again, I'm not doing this just willy-nilly, but we just have so much ground to cover that I'm going to skip ahead here to chapter 8, verse 4. God has highlighted just how horrible these people have gotten and how they've profaned his name and how they've brought idols into the temple and how they've just done horrible things. And here, listen to what he says here. Uh, chapter 8, verse 4. <clears throat> you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn, does one turn away and not repent? God's using a bit of, of interesting language here, and I want to ask you a personal question. You're walking along and you trip. You stumble. You step on something slippery and you fall. And you're down on the ground. What do you do? You get back up, right? You, you check. You make sure nothing's broken, right? But your goal is not then to lay there for the rest of your life, right? Well, I fell. I'm just going to stay here forever, right? No, that would be a horrible thing, right? Your goal is to get up, and yet God is describing his people as people who fall and yet don't care that they just fell. They just stay down. They just stay fallen. Once again, what's fascinating here 
Um, I, want, I want to ask you, when, when you look at chapter 8, starting in verse 4, and then uh, flip the page and looking through chapter 9, verse 11, is the text broken up in uh, the way it looks like in the Psalms in your Bible, or is it all just block letters continuing? Who has what? Broken up? What's interesting about this section of Scripture is there are times that the prophet is speaking, and there are times that God is speaking. But there's times that we can't figure out which one is speaking. And that's very fascinating, because it's not broken up the way that normally a conversation gets broken up, right? In English, we write, God said, then Jeremiah said, and we have brackets, and we know who's speaking, right? But here, there'll be times that the Lord says, and the Lord says, da 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 And there are times that we pick up that Jeremiah is responding. But it's fascinating how sometimes it could be the Lord speaking and sometimes it could be Jeremiah speaking. With that said, uh, I I think uh, verse um, verse 7, God goes on to highlight what has happened, how the people have fallen and why they're not getting up. Verse 7 For even the stork in the sky knows her season, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thresh observe the time of their migration. Saddest passage in the Bible right here. But my people don't know the ordinances of the Lord. The birds, the animals, can do what nature tells them to do and can observe their migrations but my people, my chosen people, my people that I called out of Egypt and I brought into a good land, don't know my oracles. I forget if verse 8 will be up here, but verse 8. How can you say, God speaking, how can you say, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes. This is one of the earliest reference to the people known as the scribes. It's some sort of profession that it deals with the law, and it's some sort of profession that is then supposed to, kind of like a priest or something of that nature, tell the people the law, instruct the people in the ways of God. And yet here we encounter these lying scribes. I want to take a moment and I want to tell you a story from my own life. Now, when I was in high school, I was not a Christian and I was not following the Lord. And if you asked me if I was a Christian, I would have told you I'm not a Christian. So when you look at my behavior and you look at my lifestyle, it did not reflect Christianity because I wasn't chasing after God, right? But one of my friends who was a Christian, And if you asked, are you a Christian? They would have said, absolutely, I'm a Christian. We got into a topic. And this topic is actually addressed in Scripture. And I pointed out to them, but the Bible says da-da-da-da-da about that topic. My friend says, that's just Paul's opinion. And that reflects that denomination's teaching on the subject that that's just Paul's opinion. Paul's an old-timer. He thinks the old way. He's a little bit of a chauvinist at times. And when he writes on that topic, that's just Paul's opinion. You can take it or you can leave it. Let me ask you, as God highlights, here's the problem, the lying pen of these people meant to teach the Word of God to the people. Is this an old problem or is this a current problem? Is this something that only happened back then or is this something that happens still today? Sad, sad. Again, I I need you to to read this yourself. There's so much information. I want to draw your attention. We're going to jump ahead again. Chapter 9. Now what's funny in the Hebrew, if we had the Hebrew Bible here, Chapter 8 wouldn't end at verse 23, it would, uh, excuse me, 22, it would have verse 23, and that would actually be our 9 verse 1. But we chose to break it there, they chose to break it there, 
And the thing is, there shouldn't be a break there anywhere, anyway because the whole text is this continual thought. What's amazing here is for all of our, our trying to figure out who is speaking, it's not clear. Is this the prophet or is this God speaking? So chapter 9, verse 1, Oh, that my head were watered and that my eyes were a fountain of tears that I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Verse 2, Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfaring lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterous, are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. There's no English translation that doesn't translate that first word in verse 1 and that first word in verse 2 as O. Oh. Do you know why that is? Because it's the same word in Hebrew. And the reason that this is there is in Hebrew, there's this thing called parallelism, where the same word will show up. And the same word is there to give you two different pictures of the same thing. Look at what happens here in verse 1. Look at what happens here in verse 2. In verse 1, whoever is speaking wants to weep, wants to cry. Their heart is broken because of the sins of the people. Verse 2 the person's ready to go. He's ready to leave, ready to leave them to their sins, let, ready to take off and just let the world go the way the world's going to go. And isn't that an interesting idea? That the same speaker, whether it's God or whether it's the prophet, in one verse, their heart is breaking for the people. And in the next verse, they're like, I'm just done with you guys. I'm going to leave you to your own devices. I don't know who's speaking here, but I can relate to both of them. I can relate to both of these passages. I want to ask you a personal question. Who here has ever sinned and faced consequences because you chose to sin? My hand should actually be up twice. <laughs> we've all done that. We've all been there. We've all chosen to sin. We knew it was sin when we did it. And when we had to, we faced the consequences because of that sin, right? Who here has ever faced consequences because of somebody else's sin? Somebody else chose to sin, and that person's choice to sin affected you. It created consequences, and you had to face those consequences. Let me give you another illustration, and let me ask you, let me ask you, am I just making this up, or is this a real world thing? Does this happen? Let's just say, we all know that there are times we can sin intentionally and hurt somebody else, right? So let's just say I choose to sin and hurt you, okay? And what do you do? You go out and you choose to sin to hurt me, right? But then somebody else sees that you hurt me and they sin to hurt you. And somebody sees that they sin to hurt you, and you sin to hurt them and hurt me. Is this, is, am I making this up, or does this happen? And let me ask you a question. When does sin ever solve sin's problem? How can that ever happen that sin can solve sin's problem? Sin can cause more sin, but sin can never get rid of sin, right? Right? So when we look at this, and when we read that whoever the speaker is wants to weep, wants to cry for the slain of the daughter of my people, I think that we're seeing in there, not necessarily, not inherently, weeping because somebody sinned and they're facing the consequences of their sin. I think we're seeing somebody whose heart breaks because they know that sin causes problems for everybody. And somebody else faces the consequences of these people's sin. But verse 2. I'm done. I'm finished. You guys just keep going on, doing your own thing. You never learn your lesson. You keep doing this. I'm going to go into the desert into a, a where freight where should have checked another translation maybe I'd get another 
another word there, right? A motel. A motel in the desert. <laughs> uh. And I'm just going to go out there. I want to tell you guys, this is honest, this is true. If you ever find out that Christy and I got stranded on a life-permitting desert island, don't rescue us. <laughs> Maybe organize drops of supplies every once in a while, but just leave us on the island. We're happy. But isn't that so true? Whoever the speaker is here, we look at the state of the world. We look at how people behave and continue to sin, and we just go, you guys figure it out. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm moving on. I think that this is something we can all relate to, and I love, once again, I, uh, maybe I'm beating a dead horse, and I'm sorry if I'm beating a dead horse, that we can't figure out who's speaking here. And I think that that's intentional because I think we're supposed to wrestle with this. I think we're supposed to struggle with this. I think that we see, if we understand the speaker to be God, I think we see a side of God that's not always there in Scripture. I think we see a depth of the heart of God and his love for his people. His love for his people that his heart breaks when his people choose to do this. And if it's the prophet, I think we see the side of a prophet that we don't normally see. A prophet, especially in the old time, is usually a doom and gloom, judgment coming, get ready, here it comes. But here we see a prophet who's seeing the destructive nature of sin and his heart is breaking, but he's also saying, I'm just going to go it myself. Leave you all to yourselves. I want to skip ahead. Once again, I'm sorry that we can't deal with every verse this morning. I want to jump to the end of uh, chapter 9, picking up in verse 25. Before we do this, we have to define our term. We have to understand what this word means. Circumcision in the Old Testament refers to the covenant with Abraham. It refers to that. And so when we see this, we should hear Abrahamic covenant, okay? Verse 25. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish those who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Well, that's an interesting contrast there. That's an interesting idea. What does that mean? Those who are in the covenant and yet those who are not in the covenant? What does that mean? Verse 26. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab. Remember, as we're listening to this, we're standing there by the temple, right? We're hearing the prophet say this. And if we're standing there by the temple and we're hearing the prophet say this, who are we? We're Judah. Did you hear what he just said? He said, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab. He just put us in a list with them. The outsiders. Those who are not part of the covenant. Can there be something more insulting that you could say to somebody? And yet, why did he say that? Well, because we have evidence that Egypt and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab practiced some type of circumcision. Yet it wasn't Abrahamic circumcision. It wasn't your part of the covenant community. It was some other form of circumcision. And God is saying that your circumcision is like their circumcision. It's not part of the covenant. It's not part of the covenant community. It's the way the world is. Egypt and Judah and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all the inhabitants in the desert who clip the hair on, the, on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised, and all of the house of Israel are uncircumcised of hearts. And you've recognized that term if you've read much of the New Testament. You realize Paul picks that up hugely in the New Testament that there's this outward circumcision and there's this inward heart circumcision. So these people have the outward, but they don't have the inward. 
And that's where I think we, today, 21st century Christians, have to hear Jeremiah's words to them, and we have to think about our religion. We have to think about our outward, inward experience. If the nation could be physically and yet not spiritually, does that mean that we somehow are immune from that? Could we possibly be immune from that? Or might we have some outward religion? Some way that you could look at us and see that we're religious. Some way that you could look at us and see that we're Christians. Without some form of an inward, some form of a personal, some form of something deep inside of us that actually changes not just the outside, but changes the inside to the outside and how we interact, how we speak, how we live, what we do. I don't think Jeremiah's words were just to them. I think that Jeremiah's words were to them for a specific time and a specific purpose, and it had to do with that. But I think we today can still learn from Jeremiah. And I don't think that we could just learn how to be better Jews. I think we can learn how to be better Christians. I think we can hear these words spoken to the children of Israel. And I think we can take them to heart and ask ourselves, as children of God, do we fall into the same steps? Do we fall into the same traps? Do we fall into the same outward religion but not inward religion that the Israelites did and the Israelites had? And I think the answer is yes. Just, just in case you were wondering. I think the answer is a, a resounding yes. I think I personally can do that. I don't think there's anybody who can't do that. So when we read the words of Jeremiah, we have to ask ourselves those hard questions as well, right? 